Welcome to Philosophy of Value Workshops number 16 of series 7. The question for today is, does ethics face insurmountable problems that cannot be resolved? The reading, for those who want it, is from one of my works, The Pursuit of Value, Chapter 4, Section 1. Now, my underlying question is again, what can we do with our lives or human existence as consciousness? And I answer this question, and it must be answered in terms of value and purpose, or possibly hmm, ethics. Along with others, like religion, aesthetics, ethics is one of our primary expressions of value. That is, ethical principles are values that guide right action. But ethical theory and morality are beset by serious problems that have not yet been resolved. My usual question is whether ethics is an adequate approach to understanding the human condition. But today I want to ask about problems of ethics even as just a guide to moral action. That is, is ethics still viable or has it been overwhelmed by its own internal problems? I have previously given critiques of the three main theories of ethics, so I won't give these critiques again here. Yet we should first define ethics and morality. Ethics and morality are often regarded as synonymous, but also sometimes as different. For Ronald Dworkin, for example, Ethics is about living a good life. Morality is about how we should treat other people. For Anthony Grayling, ethics is about character. Morality implies moralizing about right action. As for myself, I take ethics to be about theory and principles and morality to be about moral action and intention. I also use ethics to <coughs> accommodate a folkloric or ordinary view of ethics as supposedly objective. More, more specifically, I hold that morality involves judgments about matters that are deemed to be moral. They are only deemed to be moral because I believe that their content isn't fixed or, or definitive. And morality can be further defined in that those moral valuations are reflected back onto the agent. This is an aspect of my own theory of value theory ethics, but I won't argue this here and mention it only for reasons of candor and openness. Yet I disagree with the definition of ethics or morals as always having to be about relations with other people. This is because morality can obviously be about states like laziness, self-deception and authenticity. And the following discussions reveal a wider scope than just relations with other people. But relations with other people is certainly one of the problems that ethics has to deal with. The respect and value of other people is one of the issues that different theories of ethics have to deal with. Certain intuitions like the intrinsic value of people and not torturing babies are often taken as moral truths. But these are unacceptable as ethical premises because we need to know why torturing babies is wrong. And just to accept that other people have intrinsic value isn't a sufficient basis of ethical theory of action. The motivations of a sadist, for example, might be enhanced by the intrinsic value of his victim. But even assuming a good will, should we value other people more or less or the same as ourselves? To resolve these issues we need a much more explicit principle of relations with other people. <clears throat> Kant's categorical imperative st stipulates that other people are ends in themselves and must not be used as only as means. Yet his respect for others derives from a universalization of the dignity that we find in ourselves. 
but both this universalization and dignity are based on reason that has been strongly challenged. Robert Nozick describes people as value-seeking eyes and that we should give such the value that they have. But apart from his description of, val of people as value-seeking eyes, this doesn't seem to take us much further than Kant. <coughs> Utilitarianism makes an even greater assumption in the maximization of happiness for the maximum number of people. That is, the assumption that the individual will be motivated to act for the common good or the happiness of all. <coughs> now, on my value theory ethics, a value-seeking agent will respect the value of others as part of his own self-value. But value theory ethics isn't widely accepted and the intrinsic value of others is widely accepted. So we'll leave the ethical problem of other people on one side to address more pressing problems. <clears throat> At this point we should briefly consider the seemingly untenable view of ethical absolutism. This is that certain actions are always morally right or wrong in all circumstances or situations. Classic examples are slavery and of course t torturing babies for fun as Ronald Dworkin cites it. But torturing babies for fun already includes motivation, which takes it beyond an assessment of action alone. And as we have seen, that harming other people is easy, the easiest case for moral um, absolutes that we can make. Other examples like lying, stealing, sexual behaviour and religious injunctions are more difficult. There are also problems with thinking that my culture or my religion's moral injunctions are right and everyone else's are wrong. This kind of ethical absolutism is only possible in the absence of reflection. And as I will shortly outline, John Mackey argues that there are no objective values. And this includes the intrinsic value or this value of actions deemed to be right or wrong in themselves. A standard answer is that these different behaviours can express the same underlying principles. But this is a different claim and the underlying principles themselves often seem to be very different and there is no agreement or definition of what these underlying principles are. Yet Kant's extreme injunction that we must never lie, might be taken as an example of intrinsic wrong. But he also said, nothing can be conceived in the world which can, can, be, called, which can be called good except the good will. This indicates that lying is a typically logical prohibition, not one about intrinsic value. Such considerations often give rise to various forms of ethical relativity that we can now look at. Ethical relativity also arises from observing the different social practices evident in cultural relativity. The issues of both cultural and ethical relativity was recognised by Aristotle. He wrote, fire burns in both Hellas and Persia, but men's ideas of right and wrong vary from place to place. Aristotle, though, demurred on ethical relativity because he based normative, cultural and natural virtues on moderation. But his assessment of virtue or moral action weren't fixed, but depended on circumstances. He wrote, for example, that to be angry in the right way, to the right degree, for the right reason, is virtuous. So these comments indicate that there are at least three kinds of ethical relativity. One, an ethical relativity in which anything is justifiable, leading to a nihilism that no one could re realistically hold. Two, a relativity to some background code. Gilbert Harmon adds that such aren't more privileged than any other. 
and Aristotle takes an intermediate view between these two. And three, an ethical relativity in the material content of action that is nevertheless re relative to some central principle. This is my view, yet I qualify that central principle as normative, but variable on human awareness. The problem here is how to determine such a central normative principle. The usual answer is to make actions r relative to absolute moral facts. This um, accommodates variable circumstances as well as commitment to unnegotiable moral values. But moral facts are rejected by thinkers from Hume to Mackey, including myself. My response is to replace absolute moral facts with normative moral principles. Yet for the moment, let us assume that right action might be relative, but determined by some central principle. But some philosophers like Dworkin and Parfit want to determine right action for every situation. Bernard Williams has accused Kantian and utilitarian ethics of this kind of ambition. And John McDowell has also noted the uncodifiability of Aristotle's virtue ethics. Extreme variability of circumstances preclude principles that could determine right action in every situation. And Dworkin's claim that one objectively true account that yields one right answer seems preposterous. Yet both Dworkin and Parfit hold objectivist accounts of value and normative truth. And they both hold the possibility of intrinsic value of physical objects and principles. It's similarly <coughs> preposterous to suppose that there is a platonic realm where objective values could reside. The potential infinite diversity of physical circumstances needs an infinite diversity of objective values. G. E. Moore called Leibniz, Moni Leibniz monads of a multiplicity of objects an ontological slum. We could similarly describe a platonic realm of infinite objective values or actions. And as noted, Mackey's <coughs> argument against objective values also holds against intrinsic value of physical actions. It's important to note that Mackey argues that there are no objective values in the fabric of the world. Objective here means the status of ontologically substantive objects, not universality. So Mackey's <coughs> argument doesn't preclude normative or even universal values, but it remains to be seen what such normative values could be. Mackey gives three main arguments to support his view that there are no objective values. One, the direction of dependence is mistakenly reversed by making the desire depend upon the goodness. Two, his argument from queerness is that objective values would have an untenable quasi-objective status. And three, he points to the psychological <coughs> propensity of the mind to spread itself on external ob objects, also noted by Hume and Freud. I agree, because values like wanting and liking cannot exist independently of a conscious mind. On Mackey's argument from queerness, objective values would be <coughs> anomalous, because objective <coughs> entities, like bodies, can't have subjective properties like values. They are disparate kinds of things like numbers can't have the properties of colour. These considerations pose problems for pre-existing principles to determine action in all or any circumstances. One response is to turn to Aristotle's virtue theory that esteems excellence of character and disposition. That is, it looks to dispositions expressed in the virtues rather than behaviour governed by principles. 
the virtues are dispositions like courage, loyalty, honesty, generosity and magnanimity. The problem for virtue theory is that if principles of actions are difficult to discern, how can we act on them? On this issue, Aristotle was asked, if only the virtuous could act virtuously, how do we become virtuous? His answer was, practice the virtues in order to internalize them to become second nature. This answer may be adequate for applied or practical ethics, but it leaves a theory of ethics that we can believe in with crucial loose ends. Despite the recent renaissance of Aristotle's virtue theory, it also lacked an appreciation of the concept of value. Karl Marx may have overstated the point in saying that Aristotle had no concept of value. Yet virtue theory does omit Kantian moral features of goodwill and intention, as well as neglecting the value of people as ends in themselves. In her modern moral philosophy, Elizabeth Anscombe endorses this view and writes that the term moral itself just doesn't seem to fit in its modern sense into an account of Aristotelian ethics because, among other reasons, Anscombe tells us it lacks the concept of a moral sense of ought. So although virtue theory resolves certain problems, it raises others like a neglect of value. And for these and other reasons, it can't provide clear principles of action that an ethical theory needs. Yet as a response, I can draw a parallel between virtue theory and the value theory of ethics that I advocate. This is because the virtues are typically value states enabling virtue theory to be reinterpreted as value theory. And values provide guiding principles of action as well as theories of justification and motivation. But I first need to consider the ethical problems of justification and motivation. One of the major problems for ethics is the justification of moral facts or principles. That is, although moral principles may be coherent, how can they be established as moral imperatives? This question always faces problems posed by Hume's law and Moore's naturalistic fallacy. Hume's law is that a prescriptive moral ought cannot be <coughs> deduced from a factual is or morals from reason. And Hume's law or principle, also known as the is-ought problem, has never been unseated. This is despite continuous ch challenges by such as from Irish Murdoch, A.N. Pryor and John Searle. Hume's law has also thought to be proven by Moore's naturalistic fallacy. Moore's naturalistic fallacy opposes the identification of moral values with any natural properties. Moore claims that the moral good should not be confused with states like pleasant or desirable. And he also claims that the moral good is irreducible, like yellow, and therefore unanalyzable and unarguable. At the time of writing, Moore claimed that such oversight could be found in practically every ethical theory. So unsurprisingly, even today, much of science ignores the problem. Others who um, ignore it are such as Sam Harris, Edward O. Wilson, Michael Shermer, Lawrence Krauss and Stephen Hawking. And even Kant wrote that he was woken from his dogmatic slumber by Hume. Examples of breaching Hume's law and Moore's naturalistic fallacy are evident in basing morals on scientific principles, social or historical facts, facts of nature like genetics, reason or logic. The problem of justification isn't a, dif a difficulty for applied 
or practical ethics where outcomes are paramount. And practical moral order can be assured by historical, cultural, social and even genetic constraints. But justification remains a theoretical problem that still hasn't been resolved today. My response is to the problem of justification is to begin with the notion of value itself, not with moral facts or principles. This circumvents Hume's law and Moore's naturalistic fallacy. Yet this requires a value theory ethics that I don't have time to outline here. <coughs> a problem related to that of justification is the problem of m motivation or why should we act. We have already noted a classic example of this problem in the context of utilitarianism. That is, why should the individual be motivated to act for the common good or for the happiness of all? A more elaborate example of the problem is found in the standard cognitive non cognitive debate involving both Kant and Hume. Cog cognitivists like Kant <coughs> explain morals and motivation primarily in terms of reason and certain conceptions of things. Hume represents non cognitivism which seeks explanation in terms of affect and feeling. Hume famous, famously said that reason is the slave of the passions. A standard illustration is found in the question do we eat an apple because we desire it or just because we see an apple? In the case of non-cognitivist motivation from desire is intuitively compelling. But moral motivation is more complex and difficult to ascertain. Moreover, non-cognitivists claim that cognition alone is impotent and unable to motivate an action. But cognitivists claim that feeling or emotion is blind and cannot give material guidance to an action. Yet this may be a mute point because in practice both are employed in instantiating an action. And cognitive reason is widely accepted as a means towards some end. Modern analytic philosophy poses the debate in terms of the two cognitive and non-cognitive mental states. But this classification is biased towards cognitivism and defines, defines non-cognitive states ne negatively. So I supplement this classification using the four states of cognition, affect, will and value. But my point here is to refine the debate to include value into the equation. The standard debate is between cognitivist and desire-based or non-cognitivist reasons for action. Kant holds, for example, that we ought to follow the moral law just because we understand that the law is right. This sounds contentious, but truth is a fact that, there's, that, has, an, that has inescapable claims on, on us in all we do. Conversely, in Hume's view, reason is the slave of the passions and likewise in eating an apple. Cutting the Gordian knot, we, we leave aside both cognitivist and desire-based or non-cognitivist reasons for action. And we can adopt a value-based theory of action advocated by Derek Parfit as well as myself. Barry Maguire also notes the promising but surprisingly overlooked value-based theory of reason. On a desire-based theory of action, we are motivated by the satisfaction of a desire. That is, if an action promotes the satisfaction of desire, we have reason to perform that action. But on a value-based theory, reasons for actions are delivered by the satisfactions of the values pursued. Yet we should briefly add that both desire-based and value-based theories employ cognitive elements. And for perfect, the values pursued are ultimately traceable to irreducibly normative truth. But in my view, the values pursued are established on a phenomenology of experience. 
and the value-based theory of action seems to resolve both the problems of motivation and directional guidance. This is because value contains a volitional component that is required for motivational <coughs> impetus. Yet values are always directional and are values of something which provides material guidance. But again, I offer a solution without, without um, explicating it, which I do in other workshops. My objective here is to outline the major problems of ethics which may or may not be resolvable. Some of these problems do seem to be broad enough to threaten the very credibility of ethics itself. And Nietzsche, a major figure in presenting such a broad threat to ethics, is reflected in his book titles, such as Beyond Good and Evil, The Revaluation of All v Values, and On the Genealogy of Morals. Nietzsche's critique of ethics is thereby seen as both historical and psychological, as well as sociological. He looks to history to show the all-too-human origins of moral values. He looks to psychology to show the negative impulses that underlie apparently moral motives. And he looks to religion to reveal the supporting sociological ideology of ethics. Nietzsche thereby examines the Gospels to show the negative motives underlying the Christian virtues. He finds there that love is grounded in hatred and forgiveness is conditioned by payment. He is critical of retributive aspects of Christian ethics that he calls the ethics of the hangman. He contrasts the, con the Christian foundations of morality with the master morality of heroic cultures and of his superman. He regards Christianity as having a slave morality, unable to affirm positive values of life. Nietzsche's argument is that the weak are unable to achieve or even aspire to the values of the strong. The weak are thereby driven to value what they can aspire to instead of what they can't aspire to. These are values of weakness, like humility, obedience, suffering, poverty, incuriousness and acceptance. The values of strength and weakness are thereby inverted. Power is exchanged for weakness. Nietzsche rejects traditional morality and calls for a revaluation of all values but he gives no definitive replacement. He claims instead that the future task of philosophers is, is to determine the order and rank of values. He, he does, yet he does advocate replacing mo moral values with aesthetic values and even with sensuality. We haven't had time to, ex to explicate the historical, sociological and psychological details of Nietzsche's argument. Yet some of these themes are perhaps <coughs> unexpectedly taken up by Sigmund Freud. Freud writes cr critically of what he calls natural ethics, saying that it has nothing to offer here except the narcissistic satisfaction of being able to think oneself better than others. No doubt Freud had personal as well as scientific reasons for such views. Yet these included a reprehension for the ideal guilt that he shared with Nietzsche. And Freud stated that guilt was the most important problem in the development of civilization. Nietzsche's theme of sensuality is also taken up in Freud's interest or <coughs> obsession with sexuality and the libido. And for Freud, the libido is an overarching force that replaces Nietzsche's will to power. Again, these views are stated as problems for ethics, but they must be left unargued. Yet extending this critique, Hans-Georges Muller of Macau University 
has described three pathologies of moral philosophy. Its psychological pathology, pathology is an insistence on principle and an obsessive moral zeal or, fetish, or fetishization. Its social pathology is the presupposition of fundamental dogmatic language that implies truth. And he holds its philosophical pathology is to assume certain actions imply objective moral laws. And these pathologies might characterise the Kantian thought that Nietzsche was so critical of. I have myself considered that ethics and morality might be an inadequate c category to understand the human condition. And again, there is no time to argue this point, as I have done elsewhere. But in this respect, I will briefly refer to the work of Alistair McIntyre. McIntyre holds that language and practice of morality is in grave disorder and disarray. His critique of language includes mistranslations of the word moral from the Greek word ethikos. Yet his stronger critique is of the main theories of Aristotelian, Kantian, utilitarian and other ethics. Derek Parfit describes such different theories as climbing the same mountain on different sides. But McIntyre finds these theories so different as to be incommensurate. That is, they are unable to find sufficient agreement to even maintain a coherent dialogue. In conclusion, we can say that there are many problems of ethics that we haven't been able to cover here but we hope at least I've outlined the main ones, including what is ethics or morality. And the contradictions of the main ethical theories also counts as a major problem. Yet to start with, a basic or even elementary issue for ethics was determining how we should act. The easiest practical issue and the most difficult theoretical issue in this respect is relations with other people. That is, even if we re recognise the intrinsic value of others, we need a reason to respect their value. Such a reason is intuitively compelling, but theoretically elusive. The problem becomes more difficult in determining particular actions, which encourages ethical relativity. To avoid ethical relativity, some universal guiding principle is often posed. But such raises a dilemma between being too general to provide specific guidance and unrealistically attempting to specify behaviour for every possible circumstance. The problem might be resolved or exacerbated by not construing ethics to be primarily about behaviour. For example, on virtue theory, ethics is focused on character, disposition and living a good life. But virtue theory is notorious for not being able to provide guidance for one's actions. There are also standard problems here of justification and motivation in explaining why, why we should act. The question is whether these and other problems pose difficulties that ethics cannot resolve. Although we cannot choose not to act, applied ethics is able to provide practical guidance. Ethical theory is more difficult and I have questioned the adequacy of ethics as a category of understanding. In order to continue talking in terms of morality and ethics, I have suggested value theory ethics as a resolution. On this view, value itself is the guiding principle, as well as having volitional and justifying value content. The question of whether ethics is overwhelmed by problems rests on solutions such as this one. So let me have your comments and criticisms at the meeting or on websites like meetup.com or YouTube.